I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Jonah chapter 2. We're continuing our series on the book of Jonah. Uh, the Sea of God's Great Mercy. <coughs> uh, we'll be reading actually, uh, starting at verse 17 in chapter 1, and then reading all of chapter 2, <coughs> where we left off, uh, Jonah had um, tried to flee from the presence of the Lord. Uh, that phrase was actually repeated three times in chapter 1, in case you didn't catch it the first time. And uh, the Lord sent a great storm to give Jonah a course correction uh, as judgment for his sin, but also at the same time, a, a great mercy of God. <clears throat> Jonah, uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 17. This is God's holy word. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the, sea, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows, they passed over me. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then, or and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, God, may you speak through us, through the preaching and, and, and reading of your word, and may the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. It was on October 31st, 1517, that a 35-year-old Martin Luther was pronounced a heretic by the Catholic Church, of course, after his 95 theses were affixed to the castle church at Wittenberg. But if you remember, the very first thesis stated that all of the Christian's life should be a life of repentance. I'm not sure that as Christians, we always have this mindset among us today. Uh, a name you probably know, uh, Zach Bird, recommended for me to uh, read this book. We're going to get together tomorrow and discuss it. And uh, I was just reading a chapter two of, of this book yesterday. And uh, it's written for ministers, and it said a minister should be repenting every day. And this is the call of, of God's people because we are sinful. Even in our bulletin, in our worship service, we have this invocational prayer where we invoke God's presence in a special way among us. And then when confronted with his presence, we immediately go into a prayer of repentance because he is holy and we are unholy. Repentance may have negative connotations among some, but repentance is, of course, what saves us through faith. But repentance is not a once-and-done deal. You just repent for your sin, you're saved, and that's it for repentance. We come to repent all through our lives as we experience the consequences of our sins, as we feel the weight of our sin, as we see how 
good and holy and loving God is to us and how short we fall from his holy and good ways for our lives. And you see, it helps us then to live fruitful lives as Christians, as we repent and die to our sins and the Spirit works His Word into us. And a fruitful life, it doesn't merit salvation, but a fruitful life is the fruit of salvation. It's the result of being humbled. And repentance leads to even more humility. Think of the confession of faith we said today, Philippians 2, right? That even Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That that humility might be worked into us through the process of repentance as we die to our pride and die to wanting our own ways. And so often repentance is the fruit of being humbled. It's being tested by our trials, and we experience God's grace anew. Repentance is essential because it's the fruit of our faith. Today, we'll see Jonah in the throes of his sin, experiencing the consequence of his sin, and he begins to turn to the Lord, and it becomes an example for us. We can always turn to the Lord, no matter how bad we've messed things up, no matter how bad we've grievously disobeyed him. And he will use his power and his grace to draw his children continually to himself and away from our destructive ways. Uh, Today, as we look at this passage, we'll see three points, just three points today, the divine appointments, human responsibility, and divine grace. First, divine appointments. Uh, Verse 1, it says just very simply, the Lord appointed. He appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. This was no surprise to God. He had this appointment scheduled from all eternity past. Think of God's majesty and wisdom here. A great fish had been appointed by an even greater God to be at this destination, at this appointed time, to swallow Jonah. Jonah, God's prodigal prophet. Uh, one thing I notice with more and more children that we have, you know, we're up to four now, running on time becomes very difficult for us, <laughs> even more so with, with the fourth child, that we, Kelsey and I, need to plan ahead in order to keep our appointments. And you know, you may be late. You may even cancel appointments with a doctor or uh, appointments with a friend or even late for church, but you never miss the appointment with the Lord. His timing is perfect. Uh, Pastor Anthony Carter wrote that God's appointments are not invitations. By resisting God, Jonah had to learn the hard way that God keeps his appointments. Now, this is either a comfort or a source of fear or even chastisement. There are two doctrines we should see here. First is this doctrine of God's sovereignty. He has divine power. He's omnipotent. He has the power to accomplish whatever he wills. God has power over nature, over us. Nothing has power over him. Second is the doctrine of of God's providence. Uh, Westminster Confession Faith Chapter 5 states that God, the creator, the great creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things. You see, God not only has this power to do anything he pleases, but also by his wisdom, he is directing all things, all of his appointments to accomplish his wise and holy and loving plan. If you trust God, this is a comfort. Because when things don't go as we like, we know the Lord is still overseeing the events of our lives. However, if you're unfaithful, this can become a source of fear or chastisement. You cannot run from the Lord. Uh, Tim Keller calls these God's severe 
mercies. God's severe mercies. Our disobedience will be met with severe mercies for our correction. Look at what happens in the belly of the beast. Jonah, with no other option left, finally does what even the pagan sailors had tried to get him to do, to see his need and to go to the Lord in prayer. This is why Keller also said, you never realize that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. You must lose your life to find your life. No human heart will learn its sinfulness and impotence by being told it is sinful. It will have to be shown, often in brutal experience. He says, no human heart will dare to believe in such a free, costly grace unless it is the only hope. <laughs> we don't want to believe this about ourselves. God has to work it in our lives through his Holy Spirit, through his word, through his providence, through his severe mercies. Are you feeling God's severe mercies right now? Turn to him. Lifting your heart in prayer. Jonah came to the end of himself saying in verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me. Do you trust in the depth of your being that God is working his wise and holy plan for you? Even when you disobey him, when you spite him, he still calls you back. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other, the Lord tells us through the prophet Isaiah. When you're in distress, you can call out, for he will rescue you. He says through the apostle Peter, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Next, this is certainly leading into the human responsibility the human responsibility. God's severe mercies had taught Jonah of God's sovereign power and his discipline. Look at verse three. For you cast me out, Jonah says. You cast me into the deep. Your waves, your billows passed over me. Jonah saw his powerlessness and disobedience being met by the Lord saying, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. you got to remember, it was Jonah who fled the presence of the Lord. And after getting what he thought he wanted, Jonah wanted nothing more than to be back in the Lord's presence. This prayer is an example for us. Jonah is turning back to the Lord. This is the beginning of repentance. Repentance, it's more than knowing you're a sinner. Repentance is more than feeling sorry for your sins. Repentance, John Frame said, is the very act of turning away from them, and to turn from sin is to turn to goodness. See, repentance is the fruit of faith. Faith turns to Christ. Repentance turns away from sin. And John Frame says those Two turnings are the same motion. You can't turn, turn toward Christ, Frame says, without turning away from sin and vice versa. Uh, I found out just a few weeks ago that one of my former students, I taught at a Christian school, uh, he had cheated on an exam, and when caught, he refused to repent. And I was shocked. And they expelled him. Not because he had cheated, but because he had refused to repent. And I was talking to a friend here in uh, Vicksburg, and I, I said, I'm shocked that this young Christian wouldn't repent. And my friend says, if he doesn't repent, then he's not a Christian. See, repentance is the fruit of true faith. Faith and repentance are joined 
It's why the only sin a church, our church, will ever excommunicate a member from is an unwillingness to repent because it's a sign of not having faith. Is there an area in your life in which you refuse to repent? Are you living in a way like Jonah? In a way that dishonors God, that violates his holy law? Are you planning to? Do you presume on the mercies of God so you can continue to walk in disobedience against him? If so, what makes you think that you have actually experienced the grace and mercy of God at all? Why do you believe, in other words, that you are actually saved by grace if you refuse to honor him through faith and all of its fruit? Jonah confesses, I went down to the land, verse 6, whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up my life from the pit. O Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. You see, when Jonah said that he remembered the Lord, it meant more than he just recalled some memories about God. Right? It's more than just he remembered some Bible verses. In Hebrew culture, to remember has a deep meaning. So think about when Jeremiah says that God will remember our sin no more. He isn't suggesting that God forgets. That God is somehow forgetful. He means that God won't act on them because our sins have been forgiven. To not remember is to withhold an action. So for Jonah to say, I remembered the Lord, is his personal call to action. He's redevoting himself to the Lord. He's seeing his sorrow over his sin and he's turning to God and trying to turn away from his sins. He's preparing to live in new obedience. Have you turned away from sin or a particular sin that you are struggling with by asking God for forgiveness in the power to live in new obedience? Are you committing this day to live in a new obedience? Friends, I have to pause here. I'm not condemning us for sinning. We sin. We are sinners. But the point here is how do we respond to our sins? Do we give up? Do we stop pleading for God's mercies and his power and his grace to overcome them? Do we just say, hey, I'm going to live my own way? Or are we not satisfied with our fallen nature? Do we pray continually for God to put to death that sin within us and to try to live a new life? And this devotion requires divine grace, which is our last point, divine grace. You can see the grace of God in Jonah's life already, right? Jonah disobeyed God's direction, so the Lord sent a storm for course correction. Jonah needed time to suffer the consequences and to feel the weight of his sin. So the Lord prepared a great fish to imprison Jonah for three days. Jonah refused to, to call Gentiles to repent and turn to God. So the Lord used Gentiles on the ship to call Jonah to repent and turn to God. At no point does the Lord give up on Jonah nor does he give up on his people. St. Paul states that he is sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.6. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful. Jonah had to be brought to the end of himself through God's severe mercies to see that that salvation is only possible by God's grace. And Jonah ends his prayer, he says this, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is great, right? 
Sort of. I mean, everything he said there was correct. Salvation does belong to the Lord, check. You should show your thanksgiving, your gratitude to the Lord, check. Those who trust idols forsake trusting the Lord, check. So what's the problem? Scholars know here that Jonah is contrasting himself with those who worship idols, right? But who specifically is Jonah referring to? And, and it's really interesting. Biblical scholars, they, they vacillate. Is Jonah talking about the sailors he just met on the ship? Or is he talking about the Ninevites to whom he must now go and minister that he doesn't want to go and minister to? It doesn't really matter. Because that's not the point here. The point is, Jonah, despite experiencing God's severe mercies, still feels superior to those he was sent to minister. God's grace in saving him from, from these circumstances has not humbled Jonah enough to see that he needs God's grace just as much as those whom he hates. The sailors feared the Lord before Jonah did. He initially refused to go to Nineveh because of his superiority over them and his hatred of them. And even after experiencing God's grace anew, that superiority still remains. God's grace has humbled Jonah to a degree, but as we'll see later, Jonah will require even more grace and even more severe mercy than his pagan counterparts. Uh, Michael J. Wilkins, he's a, a professor and a dean at Talbot School of Theology. Uh, he recollected something similar in his own life, saying, and, and this is a long quote here, I'm going to read it. He said, quote, I sat under the brilliant stars in a jungle in Vietnam, and their significance overwhelmed me. I was a member of a cocky airborne infantry combat battalion. We were a well-trained, exceedingly efficient war machine, and I had killed gleefully that day. I had ripped the life from other young men without a, twin, uh, without a tinge of, of conscience. Yet probably none of us on either side could really offer any adequate explanation for our animosity. He said, that night, I experienced brokenness. I became poor in spirit as I recognized the depth of my depravity and shuddered as I considered the possibility of my fate before God, if he existed. I mourned at the evil in me and at the evil that I saw emerge so quickly in all of us. And for the first time in my young life, I understood I was not the invincible captain of my ship. I could be killed at any moment. So from that very night, I began to realize that there was indeed a very different way to live. Meekness, righteousness, mercy, purity. They all became so much more clearly preferable than the way that I had been pursuing significance and success. God humbled him through his own sense of pride. He brought him to the end of himself. Jonah believed himself to be the captain of his own ship. Invincible, and that, that he could get away from the Lord, from his presence. And the Almighty dispelled him of that belief. But Jonah still held on somewhere deep in his heart to just a little bit of it. Jonah saw the idols of the people he despised so clearly, but he could not despise the more subtle idols within his own heart. Are we people of superiority? Are we people who are judgmental? Are, am I the kind of person who has the talent of seeing what's wrong with everyone else but cannot see the problem in my own heart? How do you look at others? Do you compare yourself? Do you feel superior as if you're better? Do you feel inferior as if, you know, others, everyone else is better than you? Both are ways to view others by measuring 
against your own merits and failing to see God's strength and his grace and your own need and their own need. And see, in this prayer, Jonah, he begins to see his need. He begins to see his disobedience. He begins to see God's grace anew, but not fully. He says this in verse 2, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. Sheol in Hebrew thought uh, was the place of the dead. And that's why, you know, theologians debate here whether Jonah actually died after being thrown into the storm in the fish's belly. They, some scholars think he actually died and was resurrected. Either way, it, I don't have an opinion on that. Resurrection, resurrection is what's happening here, whether it's literal or metaphorical. Verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Jonah is spit out and he's given another chance. Grace is still at work within him. Even though his repentance isn't perfect. Our repentance is never pure. Our motives are always mixed. And God knows that. And he's grace, full of grace and mercy towards us still. Do you need to be brought out of the pit? of God's severe mercies? Do you need to be saved out of the belly of your own uh, superiority or inferiority? You can pray directly to God. You can cry out your circumstances. You can confess your sins, even imperfectly, and ask God for the power to change. And it's all because of an even greater Jonah. Jesus experienced the most severe mercy Mercy, because Jesus was swallowed by the great fish of God's judgment in our place for our sin, saying, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12. This, the most severe of all divine appointments, opened the door for us to experience God's grace, to know that, that he is with us, that we cannot flee from his presence ever. You see, Jesus was, was thrown out into the storm so that we could be brought into the family of God. And like Jonah was sent to preach repentance for Nineveh, for their salvation, a greater prophet than Jonah has not only preached repentance for salvation, but he has opened the door for us through his own blood, through the cross, through the empty tomb, that he has saved us. Just all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ, we thank you that you are the greater and truer prophet, uh, that you have not only come with the words of God, but that you are the word of God, that you have given us the sign of Jonah, that you were crucified, that you received the cup of God's judgment uh, in our place, that you have opened salvation to us, that we, even though we have sinned against you, that we have rebelled against you, that we have spited you uh, with our words, our thoughts, and our actions, that you still are with us, never to leave nor forsake us. Uh, Lord, out of that work, repentance into our hearts, continue to put sin to death within us. May we be people of, our, of, of humility, knowing our own finite and sinful nature. Uh, may that lead us to uh, be people of humility and mercy and grace towards others. In other words, may we reflect something of the image of Christ uh, back to those, um, our neighbors and our family and those whom we love, we pray. Amen.